Welcome everybody to FUP. I apologize for this crowded room. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were many more who wanted to come and who, to whom you had to say that no, there is no room. So you are privileged to come here and listen to this uh, lecture. Uh, I can uh, tell you that this might be the last time you are in this room. Uh, we are moving, the Secretariat is moving in a few weeks time and next meeting of, of this nature probably will have it in a bigger room. So we can keep up the, the fraternity sort of model but have a, a, a few more uh, auditors coming, being able, being able to take on a few more people. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, a time, a very dark time. Very much is happening in the world, wh wh which looks uh, quite uh, scary. And therefore, if there is any ray of hope, we want to bring this up and, uh, in a foof. And uh, presently, it looks like after many years of, of hardship that uh, one country in Africa is, is uh, moving in a positive direction. And a lot of interesting things is, are happening. And we are, have therefore asked one of the most prominent researchers, actually economist and, and, and political scientist, uh, Fantushiro, who has done a lot of research on Africa, Africa relationship with the rest of the world, and of course a lot of work on, on Ethiopia. He has just finished an, an enormous work of how many pages? A thousand. A thousand pages. <laughs> Oxford um, <laughs> book on Ethiopia, which will be, be um, um, published in January uh, next year. And we might come back to that in one way or another. He's also publishing a, a huge uh, anthology on Africa-Chinese relationship, mm -hmm. uh, which we also, I hope, will be able to come back to in, at FUF. But today we will look at Ethiopia and uh, we will look at what is happening with some, of course, historical... Uh, one always has to look backwards in, uh, when walking forward and also to see the challenges that the new developments, uh, that follow from the new development. We are very happy to see you here, Phantom, as always. The f uh, and remember, these are not for... Uh, for uh, making, uh, it, it, these are not loudspeakers, they are for the, the film that, that the Marlin is taking, because this is directly filmed on, on uh, our homepage. So, Fantu, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Leonard. I told him that I would rather speak standing up, because that's the nature of how I do my job. Uh, thank you all of you for coming uh, after a long days of uh, work. And I would try to speak probably for 30 minutes, uh, 30, 30, 40 minutes maximum, so that we can have exchange and, uh, and try to give you a you know, synopsis of what's going on in Ethiopia, but also with a view of trying to also uh, talk about the prospects for uh, democratization uh, ahead of us. Uh, I think it's very important to contextualize what's going on in Ethiopia right now. We have to have put it in a very historical context. And I think at the time when the whole world appears to be falling apart, uh, Ethiopia is probably a country once considered to be a place of sorrow and grief, uh, seems to be, uh, you know, inspire hope. Uh, although there will still be, you know, rivers to cross and mountains to climb and uh, on the way to this democratic transition. Of course, you know, the kind of democratic transition is not going to look like the one you and I are familiar with. It will have probably an Ethiopian characteristics for historical reasons, for political reasons, which I will come back in a minute. I think... Uh, Managing, you know, political transitions are never, never easy. Uh, I can only uh, take you back to, to 2010, uh, the Arab Spring, which started in Tunisia, headed on to 
Cairo. You remember those amazing picture from Tahrir Square. And Egypt is now in a state of darkness. All those progressive students, leaders, civil society, leaders are all dead, gone to jail. Uh, it's a period of darkness. So that excitement that we witnessed in 2010, 2011, 2012, it's all gone. So Ethiopia is no exception, although we should celebrate what's going on right now. Uh, as I say, transitions are very difficult to manage. Uh, there is no guarantee which direction the, the current pace of reform is going to go. Uh, it depends, of course, on the lineup of the balance of social forces on the ground. Uh, social forces, welcome, <laughs> social forces are our committed to democratization, social forces that are determined to keep the status quo as is. So, uh, in as much as we can celebrate, one should be aware of the history of transitions. And there is no guarantee the current pace will proceed as, 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 as expected. But of course, you know, I'm, you know, I've been a student of this for a long time, and with one little caveat, you know, because I don't want to send you home with depressing news, I think that certainly there will be a lot of zigzags in the process, but the train will keep moving on in terms of its eventual destination, what eventual destination will remain to be seen. So in a sense, I think that's why important that I, we situate the current process. Uh, so the country, in a sense, I would say is experiencing a promising and terrifying moment today. It's a mixed bag. It's promising, it's also terrifying, because there are so many unknowns, there are so many challenges one have to take into account. But also this is happening in the face of rising people's power. People's power that's not organized. People's power that cannot be yet marshaled into an important you know, to lead into more structural things. It's a very diffused people's power, you know, in many ways. It's, it's driven by anger, it's driven, driven by grievances. So the question is how to mobilize this into a more democratic uh, uh, process will remain, remain to be a challenge. So, uh, so this, 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 this massive rising people's power in the face of a declining uh, legitimacy of the institutions of the state. There's an unbelievable level of distrust of the institution of the state. The first effort is going to be how to restore uh, in people's minds the integrity of the state, that the process is fair, the process is legitimate. So the question of the erosion of state power, legitimacy of state power, is quite, quite frightening in many ways. So to the extent that the Prime Minister Abi you know, you know, it's, it's initiated this process, but one cannot hope to restore the legitimacy of the state in the absence of redressing past injustices committed by the institutions of the state. I can remember back a question and answer question uh, period in, in Parliament, when one of the me member of Parliament from one of the parties uh, from the uh, TPLF was questioning the the right of the, or the, the, the decision of the Prime Minister to release thousands of political prisoners considered to be terrorists. The Prime Minister's answer was, you know, who is a terrorist? <coughs> we are the terrorists. The state is being the terrorist. So that admission was an amazing admission, basically to say, we are the terrorists. You know, let's not point finger two other groups, rather, we have been, the state has been terrorizing. So, in a sense, there is this amazing uh, process uh, that takes place in the country. But let me, to put this into context, let me, let me give you some background. Background, particularly what happened post-2015, August 2015. Uh, uh, the political crisis that started in August 2015 Immediately, this is three months after the ruling party got 100% of the vote. P totally, I mean, literally 100. They did not even spare one seat. It was a complete, 
you know, that happened three months after the election, the whole thing began to blow up. So the political crisis, the post-2015, had its root, of course, in the 1974 student-led revolution. That went wrong. I mean, I am part of that generation, you know. Uh, what a major role to play. Sometimes very bad role to play. So uh, that I had been. So it started off the 1974 revolution. And it led basically a student-led revolution. That went wrong because the, in the legacy of the military junta that ruled from 1974-1991. The subsequent takeover of power by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Party, what's called EPRDF, I'll use a lot of acronyms here, in 1991. The and then the return of the student revolutionaries of the 1970s uh, that overthrew the imperial regime. So there's continuity in the history. The student movement have been central in all these, the good and the bad in the system. In this regard, I cannot overemphasize, really, trying to understand the present context. I cannot overemphasize the importance of history, the importance of ideology and particularly the role of Marxism in Ethiopia's contemporary political uh, triumph and tragedy. So I will come back to this, to this uh, later on. Uh, so I'll come back to this thing later on, to the, at the end of my conclusion. <laughs> so what we're dealing, negotiating right now is the coexistence of conflicting values about what is Ethiopia or what should Ethiopia be on a variety of issues being contested. This, so the question, the challenge in terms of the transition period is the reconciliation of these three perspectives. The development and developmental state-oriented laws post-1991 and the socialist feature which has always been there as part of the student movement, the military junta, but even the current regime. And then, of course, there are also layers of Western liberal values. How do we, the, the transition is going to revolve around contestation and attempt reconciliation of these competing ideologies, competing values, a subject I will come back. Let me start out again the prelude to the crisis, prelude to the post-2015 political crisis, particularly the Oromo and the Amhara protest, those period, these two dominant ethnic groups, and the consequences of that. And I think here, uh, to give you an idea, right here, somewhere here, is the capital city, Addis Ababa. This is the Oromia region. Okay, I want to put this map immediately. Uh, and the key factor, the triggering factors in the Oromo, uh, this is a protest that took place you know, post during that period. But what was the, the key triggers? What are the underlying features and actors that led to the Oromo protest uh, in, 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 in 2015? The first is, of course, political. The political, I said, particularly the May 2015 elections and the perceptions of political marginalization by the Oromo. Imagine the, the EPRDF is made up of four political parties, which is basically the Amhara, which has now become the Amhara Democratic Party, and the Oromo Democratic Party, which used to be called OPDO, and the Southern People's Nationalities Party, and then the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. All of these parties were basically, until currently, all these parties were basically the creation of the TPLF. They were not really authentic parties. They were allied in to the dominant, the most influential, ideological influential, the TPLF. So one has to understand where they come from, how autonomous were they from the TPLF political dominance in many ways. So this thing is going to fracture later on. So the, the 2015 election was very critical. It became the, the rallying cry of the Oromo protest, 
basically our vote was stolen. Okay, in the sense that the the Oromo uh, uh, Democratic uh, People's Organization, which is basically a satellite party or a puppet party, the organization. So the people said, you know, basically that there was 100% victory, and people felt their, their voices had been had been basically uh, stolen. The second factor, really, uh, here is the the OPDO, so Oromo People's Democratic or not, ma Marginalization within the PRDF, uh, within the coalition, that it has basically marginal role, despite the fact it's supposed to be representing a region. <coughs> the third factor, of course, has to do with the sudden death of the prophet, which is, in this case, Prime Minister Malas. His death in 2012, basically the changing political dynamics within the EPR death, a sense of people feeling a post malice moment is in the making, showing the vulnerability of EPR death, uh, the vulnerability of the ruling party. So m the death of Malas also created a political vacuum. He was basically the maestro, the conductor. Nobody knows, I mean, they, they know, basically he dominated everything. He sucked out political system. Once he died, there was nobody to replace him. So total confusion in the ideology. The third, of course, had to do with the identity issue, which is basically uh, the, uh, the uh, trigger by the, what I call by this, let me see if I have it here, by the, what he calls the Addis Ababa Oromia Integrated Master Plan. And I if you remember, Addis Ababa is, Basically, in, in the previous map I showed you, it's right here, okay? So what happened is the integrated master plan basically tried to amalgamate significant amount of land from Oromia region. The capital city was basically the, the limit to growth, the, the geographical limitation. So the master plan envisioned amalgamated huge significant amount of land from Oromia region for industrial parks, for urban development, you name it. And that was considered by the Oromo uh, you know, resistance student and others as land grabbing. And indeed, there was land grabbing. I'll come back to talk about my own experience dealing with the particular development of you know, uh, dump site, which uh, people resisted, not only because of the question of compensation that came in. So the identity issues were perceived as an annexation, as an annexation of Oromo territories. The status of Addis Ababa is still being debated. It's not out of the woods yet. You know, it's not out of the woods. That is basically, there is draft proclamation. Uh, the, or the interest of Oromia in Addis Ababa, this is a ve very controversial issue. I don't know which way it will go. Uh, very, very controversial issue. So the Oromos as an ethnic majority, they deserve, you know, cultural recognition, etc., etc., became an important element. The third factor, of course, is the the, eco the fifth factor that had to do with the economy. The economy is basically has been the sense that the economy is dominated. Key sectors of the economy is, is dominated by the TPLF or the TPLF aligned. Uh, monopolies, big corporations that have dominant. Uh, so on the, there was also debate about the total domination of the economy in this regard. See the large scale you know, expropriation of land from Oromo farmers in the context of landless, leading to landlessness, uh, little no appropriate compensation. Uh, most of the so-called investors also happen to be from the Tigray region. All these perceptions, some is true, some are not true. Trigian, Tigrayan domination of the economy, etc., etc., was also one green. So there are four different factors that created you know, the, you know, the, the conditions for resistance to, to come, to come to, to, in 2015. But who were the actors? The actors in this protest. Now, who was involved in this protest? First, of course, Oromo youth, called the Quero. They use 
university, stu you know, university students, significant number. They still control enormous influence. You know, uh, they are dispersed. You know, you know, yet have significant influence in many ways. Farmers. Uh, whose land has been expropriated, particularly farmers closer to the capital city. Uh, opposition parties, in this case, the, or the Oromo Federal Congress, uh, the Oromo Liberation Front, uh, sections of OPDO, OPDO which was too much tied into the PR, within the APRDF, you begin to see divisions beginning to emerge. So sections within the OPDO, so begin to talk about power renegotiation. So, the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, the President of the Oromea region, uh, President Lama, they were part and parcel of the OPDO. They came from the EPRDF OPDO arrangement. You know, I've always believed changes in Ethiopia will have to take on the watch of EPRDF. And it is happening in many ways. To what direction remains to be seen. But these people, I think the, the reform process that's underway right now, is really being led by people who were basically part and parcel of the system, you know, part of the, origi the original party as well as part of the AP APRDF. Both of the, the prime minister and the president came from the, sec the security structure or the APRDF. So they are part of the system. So these are the groups that are, and then you were artists or more business groups. The diaspora has been significant in this resistance post-2015 uh, situation. What has been the outcome of the protest? And, and then after this, I'll go back to talk about our Amara protest. So what do we begin to see? OPDO, which was completely discredited organization. As a result of these changes, you begin to see the emergence of a new assertive OPDO, OPDO leadership. You know, talking about regional autonomy, talking about economic revolution, talking about a new role in the national political. So this was basically led by the current president of Romea, President Lama. Abi, who was, of course, the head of OPDO office, uh, led the revolution in Romea. They begin to listen a lot to the young people. They finally begin to listen what was going on on the ground and begin to listen. So they begin to, be, to, to really begin to, uh, begin to associate, disassociate themselves in many ways to the larger narrative of the, the APR dev. Uh, the second, of course, the impact has been the reconfiguration, uh, the reconfiguration of Ethiopia's traditional tripartite politics. Uh, a fine line of political networking and solidarity begin to emerge, particularly among the Amhara on the Oromo. These are two groups that are considered to be a protagonist in the past. TPLF used that very well to its own advantage. For the first time, you begin to see a flip side. They begin to recognize the larger picture and begin to make political alliances. That doesn't mean there was no division within each of these parties, you know. Uh, the final cleanup, for example, with Amhara just came while I was still teaching at Bardar University three weeks ago during the last party congress. A massive cleanup of those loyalists tied into the uh, Tigray uh, uh, People's Liberation uh, Front. Uh, so in a sense, emerging political alliance between, in the, in the meantime, to counter this Amhara or Romo alliances, you begin to also see emerging alliance between the TPLF and the political leadership of the Somali region. Unfortunately, that the Somali president is now in jail. The Somali regional president is now in jail. Uh, uh, there was, of course, delayed federal intervention uh, in terms of dealing with that regional problem. But uh, I'll come back to this issue later on because there's an emerging crisis right now between Tigray region and Amhara region. And is a potential conflict, a potential armed conflict between these two regions, is that going to be a pretext for federal intervention? So I don't know, but I'll come back to this issue later on. So there was, in a sense, hegemonic struggle between regions within the TPLF that the TPLF tried to, to exploit. Uh, so this is the context was involved. And then, of course, we had the Amhara protest. 
of August 2016. This was to fo basically followed a year later. Uh, what was the issues involved here? Uh, this is basically illegal annexation of territories um, in Amara territories into the territories of Tigray. Basically, Walkite is actually a very bad right now in that region, to tell you today. Really bad situation happening between the two regions. Interference of the Tigray People's Liberation Front in the internal affairs of the Amara, using local Amara agents that are members of the Amara party. So using basically you know, uh, their, their own puppets in that region. Uh, the rise of ethno-nationalism is kind of Amara nationalism also Part of, part of the process. Who are the actors in this movement? I'll come back to a very detailed issue to come back. Uh, coming back to this territory, you go, have to go back to 1976. And within the Tigray Liberation Front, uh, there's an idea of creating a Tigray Republic uh, someday. So the independence from Ethiopia was part and parcel. Never thought that they would take over power after 1991. But there have always been this issue. So as you can see here, this is a Tigray territory. This may basically the Republic of Greater, the Greater Tigray air, you know, idea has always been part and parcel of the TPLF in the, in the, during the period of armed struggle. And basically, they really claim to have a number of Amara territories. So if you look into Tigray prior to 1991, and Tigray after 1991. It became a very enlarged territory. And where, how did this enlarged territory came from? This is the region that had been incorporated by 1995 as the dominant party. This is from North Wallo region, which is of course Amara region. So you can see a major territorial expansion by TPLF. So these groups, there are many groups, you know, there are the command, the Walkite, there is uh, a number of other groups are now currently demanding that they be integrated, integrated back into the Amhara region. They don't want to be part of the Tigray region. So an identity issue is fundamental in this issue. But this happens really immediately as part of the larger agenda of greater Tigray Republic, of course, by 1991, they have moved on. You can come back and see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to take over. So, what are the consequences of these two resistance, 2015, 2016, and continuing during that period? Uh, the consequences have been uh, imposition of two state of emergencies, very draconian state of emergency. Uh, the first state of emergency was passed in October 2016. No internet, no nothing. If you're caught, you know, watching through Facebook, I mean, this was unbelievably, it was so draconian. It's a pushback from the government. Rather than opening up the political process for a position transition to a more democratic system, the state basically cracked down. The number of people who went to jail, we will never know. We will never know. A lot of people died also during this period. Significant number of people. Massive arrest of students, farmers, you name it. We will never know. The government, in fact, right now, still of opinion, there are still secret prisons that they have not discovered. So there's a lot have to be done in, in, in terms of what the government can do. And then the second state of emergency was passed in August 2017. By that time, the political contradictions within the various political parties have become far. I, believe me, there's a lot. Maybe someday I'll write a book about it. This period was unbelievable period. Unbelievable period of, you know, uh, contradictions and uh, massive infighting within each of the parties, intra-party competition. It was a brutal period uh, that basically resembles uh, Stalin's Russia in many ways. Very, very difficult pe period. Crackdown was massive. So there had been heightened political division within the APRDF coalition. 
So by the time of Prime Minister Abiy, uh, Haile Mariam uh, resigned, uh, the so-called EPRDF was technically weakened to a point that it cannot lead any mean meaningful reform. There was a period when I left in September 2017, after running our last Ethiopian seminar there, I really thought the country was going to war. To a point I basically said to people goodbye. It was that bad. But even moving all the way to, uh, to March, uh, to February this year, quite a significant, significant changes that, that have taken place in terms of the contradictions. So let me just come back to, to is that okay? Okay. <laughs> to the leading into the final, final meeting of EPRDF to elect a new prime minister after the resignation of Prime Minister Haile Maria. He was already a caretaker government. The final hours, each of the parties have 35 or 45, I don't remember now my numbers. Uh, it's about a total of about 180 people voting. To, it was the most dramatic two weeks. Dramatic uh, stuff that went on behind the scene uh, in terms of. Uh, I myself, as a political observer, was completely surprised Prime Minister Abiy was elected as Prime Minister. He has literally zero chances, zero. He literally squeezed in the last minute. And the hope was for the president of Oromia region, uh, Lama Mergesa, to become the prime minister of the country. The problem is he couldn't because he's not a member of parliament. Except I, only Abiy is a member of parliament, head of a PDO office. So what they did is they switched places. Lama was not an egotistical person. He was not power hungry. He basically switched in. He remained president of Oromia region, and Abi was elevated to 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 uh, to represent the the, the party uh, as, as as candidate. Uh, so the question was that in the final hour, there were three candidates. So in the southern region, a real fascist guy, which I hated. If he has been a prime minister, the country would have been in hell. And, and there was a second person from Amhara region, who is the current deputy prime minister, Makonnen. And then Abiy. TPLF didn't put a candidate. They did in a sense, but they're not officially put in places. And the final hour when the vote were to come, the only way that Abiy can win if the Amara candidate, the current deputy prime minister, the final hour, the final minute, he withdrew. Then Abiy became the prime minister. So that Amara Oromo alliance, they were been doing their homework. It was basically a chess game, a real chess game. And, and consequently, they were able to come on top. He became the prime minister in April, uh, uh, 2017. So let me uh, come back to uh, to the to talk about the the uh, the changes since April uh, uh, 2018, which is really we are about in our seventh month right now. Uh, uh, he became a prime minister on April 2nd. Uh, after, of course, I said the resignation of Prime Minister Haile Mariam and all the drama that went on uh, in, in the various political parties. Let me just first start with the first three months. You know, uh, you know, this period for me remind me my time in South Africa between 1991 and 1993 period. Uh, because, you know, you have to go to bed with one, one eye open. Otherwise, if you sleep for five hours, you miss everything. That was exactly what's happening in Ethiopia right now. Literally every hour, even the last 12 hours, so much has happened, uh, which, which is to my surprise. Uh, so I think 
the, in the first three months, the focus, of course, has been political reform, the announcement of the need for political reform, and first uh, way of getting legitimacy has been uh, to free thousands of political de uh, detainees, include, including the opposition leader who was in death row, uh, under Gacho Tege, who has been hijacked from the Yemen airport and put in, he's a British citizen, uh, and he was freed, which was just completely stunned the TPLF and all the other people, uh, who was basically sent to death. Not only he freed him, he actually the last hour as he was being driven to the airport, you know, he demanded that he need to see him. So he brought him back to the prime minister's office, that infamous picture that just killed everybody, you know. And that was a major. And uh, he further invited all opposition groups uh, living overseas to return home. Uh, you know, I myself had some serious reservation about that, but I think given the idea was to have a big tent and bring everybody uh, under one tent was a good idea. Ensuring that all political parties uh, come to the table, ensuring that there is uh, a loyal opposition within the system to encourage, to encourage, uh, to, to be strengthened. Uh, even the opposition groups uh, uh, who advocated violence, including the Oromo Liberation Front, who still refuses to be disarmed, you know, uh, have come back, uh, joined the dialogue, uh, and uh, on the 19th of April, immediately he acted to replace the heads of the federal police internal security, uh, retired the chief of staff of the army in a very nice way. Just retired them, give them a diploma, put some kind of medal. Why, why create a problem? Why the, you know, so the strategy has been, you know, there are people who say these people should be shot on the spot. They should be hanged. No, no, no. That could have created its own contradiction in many ways. So he kind of find a good ways of retiring people. On the 5th of June, uh, he lifted the second state of emergency two months early. You know, there was a lot of people who were opposed to that, that the state of emergency should remain. Agreed to accept the border uh, ruling, the Algiers agreement with Eritrea. That was just unbelievable what it has done, what it's opened, how the things cascaded. His very visit to Asmara, a reciprocal visit by President Isaias, it just was just mind boggling. You know, that's why I say you couldn't sleep. Things, you know, this was done without any external intervention. That unleashed a whole set of processes, particularly within the two countries. Uh, countrywide also, the Prime Minister held countrywide consultation. He traveled unbelievably throughout the country, uh, across the country, listened to the grievances of people, in all regions of the country, talk to them in open discussion in more transparent ways, which was basically stunned Ethiopians. <coughs> because no Ethiopian leader speak to his people. You know, citizens were treated like donkeys. You know, for the first time, that kind of treatment, people just literally, for, I, I think for the first three months, people were just so drunk with happiness. You could not have any dialogue. I mean, literally, you know, the entire country was frozen. So, so the peace with Eritrea, but also opened up additional opportunity to open up peace with Djibouti, Djibouti and Eritrea, Eritrea and Somalia. So it has all of a sudden you have a regional dimension, open opportunities for a constructive journal. And, and so this was an important development in a very short period of time. And the internal process of the ruling party also begin to undergo process. In fact, you don't hear any communique from EPRDF anymore, thank God. Plus, you know, you need a translator. Typical the communist lang language propaganda stuff, you know. As a, an Amharic speaker, I, somebody has to translate to me. But I'll be talking directly right now. Uh, so there is internal process of the EPRDF. So what you have is EPRDF is still alive, but it is EPRDF slash OPDO and them. It's not EPRDF TPLF anymore. 
the PRDF exists, but much of the staff is really right, was with the uh, Oromo Democratic Party and the Amara Democratic Party. The TPLF element is basically doesn't exist there. That doesn't mean TPLF still doesn't have power. It has a lot of power in many ways, destructive power in many ways. The second month, the second, the second three months, uh, uh, on the 9th of July, uh, alongside with the Eritrean president, he declares the end of the war uh, between the two countries. Isaias is actually right now at this moment, he is in Ethiopia. You know, a second visit within three weeks' time. Uh, this involved actually in a more regional meeting with the Somali president. Uh, so the September 11 reopens the land border with Eritrea. People just could not believe it. People just go back and forth right now. Trade is booming. The cities that have died for 20 years are basically alive. Although now reg new regulations on trade investment is being drafted right now by the, the, by the Minister of Customs. Uh, uh, they sh because they need to have that, you know, in terms of currency, in terms of a number of issues. On the 29th of September, uh, uh, at the end of the APR Dev Congress, IB was reappointed as 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 as, as a uh, as a po you know. I'll, I'll finish in five minutes. Uh, on the 20th of October, uh, uh, the 16th of October, of course, he appointed half of the ministerial positions of women. Uh, reduce the number of ministries from 28 to 20, so you have 50-50 appointment. And believe me, much of this appointment have been both on, both genders have been very good, competent people. It was not, you know, dividing by parties as it used to be. It's not divided by ethnic divisions of part, you know, ministerial seats, but more about on competence. The language of competence has become very important, merit-based appointment. Uh, we have now the first time the first female defense minister. Uh, and in fact, the defense review is going on today and yesterday. I don't know, because there's an element to restructure the armed forces. Uh, after the incidents of uh, uh, a, month, uh, a previous month about a contingent of army marching into the prime minister's office, refused to disarm until they talked to him. And they were managed to defuse the problem by ordering them to do push-up. Actually, a week later in his report to Parliament, he, he revealed that it was an attempt to kill him, actually. Uh, so there's a lot of element that comes in. Uh, in October uh, 20th, appointed the first female president of the country, Salih Rokzode, very good, very competent person at the UN level. And November 1st, he appointed one of my best friends, Maza Shenafi, as the head of the Federal Supreme Court. Uh, a lot is going on in, in many ways. And then two days ago, he yeah, basically abolished the, the Ministry of Propaganda Affairs, we call Government Communication Office, is now under the Prime Minister's Office, appointed two fantastic, competent young women as a Prime Minister spokesperson, and very, very impressive staff. So the, the, the vibe is very good, but there are also challenges ahead. So what are the prospects? for the future. I don't know if I have a slide on that. I'll come back to that. What are the underlying challenges that the country faces? At the core, as I said, is this coexistence of uh, uh, the, this ideology I talked about. <coughs> the coexistence of three set of uh, competing ideologies, competing worldviews, rooted in the past. That's why I say history is important, you know. So the past is important to understand. And parallel to traditional, traditional systems of governance, economic and social governance. It will take time to sort out this, because it's, it's in us. Uh, the contradiction between these competing ideologies. On top, of course, you have the development of state-oriented laws on the economy, on the nature of the state, the role of, you know, very heavily. The government have not renounced the developmental state model. We're embedded in it. There are laws and regulations on property, on taxation, that governs a whole set of issues. That, that is there. You know, how do you sort out? 
And the, and the merit, of course, is the socialist feature. Uh, uh, all the socialist feature from the past, even before the military came to power in 1974. You know, there was an element of the socialist features in the system. How are you dealing with that? And the third is also there are layers of Western liberal values on democracy, on human rights, and property rights. It's not easy for our people to come outside, do this and do that. These things are real. How do, how do they sort themselves out, this contradiction? You know, in a sense, we are you know, prisoners of the past, prisoners of our own history in many ways. And this is going to take time, these processes. So what we see right now is reform at a macro level. We go deeper. The old structure is intact, really intact. You know, and how do you change that? That is going to be very difficult. Let me just take uh, the case of issues of citizenship. This young lady who just became the prime minister's uh, uh, press secretary, the stock person, already questions are being raised whether she should have that job. Not because she's, she's not competent enough, no. Because she's a Canadian citizen. There is a proclamation within the Ethiopian constitution that forbids people like me, you know. The same goes to the opposition groups. Most of them who come, who are, come from outside, they are Swedes, they are Americans. How do they participate in the political process? How do you go back registering? So, so the debate over these last few days with regard to the roles and responsibility of the new uh, federal judge, my friend Mazas, the prime minister is telling her, you need to go and visit the prisons. Other people are telling her, you need to have questions of you know, judicial vetting, how judges are vetted into the process. I think the most important is the state wants to empower itself quickly, given the corruption of the bureaucracy, given the bureaucracy remains of the old order, is to deal with the citizenship issue, the dual citizenship issue. The people, not that I have been interested in, and have government position, I'm too old. But there are many competent people who can come in. You know, there's a young doctor that I know from University of Michigan who has just, just been appointed yesterday to become deputy uh, at the Ministry of Health. I am sure she's an American. So what are you going to do with her? So the priority is actually to change these laws immediately. It's an amendment. It's not a complete constitutional review, but rather to look at that article, to push through Parliament, change the citizenship law, so that more and more competent people the government can use in the short term, in a critical positions in the government. So. So again, how do we reconcile all these various laws become critical? Second will be how do you build a democratic system? Uh, how to create a proof political order will take time. And this is very much related to the burning issues of identity and how to ch teaching the notion of ethnic federalism. Ethnic federalism has been at the core of a problem. at the core of the problem. It was basically trying to deal on the so-called the national question coming out of you know, Stalin and others and our response to that. Ethnic federalism actually becomes a problem. I don't think federalism is a problem. The fact is, it's ethnic federalism. Once the genie is out of the bottle, you cannot put it back. How do you, how do, you do it? I've seen these gerrymandered communities, you know, in another region, as the command in the other, uh, as, as I, I talked about. How do you do the, 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 the to create a pluralist political order is going to remain a challenge. Third, is a political vacuum. Uh, young people are taking matters on their own hand. 35% of Oromia was liberated by young people. They are literally just firing office holders. Get out of here, you're no more representing us. We are in charge until the government appoints somebody else. 
So in a sense, there's an element of lawlessness, but for a very good reason, because you don't want these people who have been part and parcel of an instrument of oppression to continue to run a ballet level, zonal administration, etc. So the federal is not yet been, the federal government is not yet able to assert itself in all parts of the country. There is, a, 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 you know, because of this political vacuum, there is insecurity. The political insecurity, uh, there is, uh, that is going to be uh, quite a challenge, how to assert that control. And then the question of managing diversity and highly ethnicized, the politicization of ethnicity, deliberately done by the previous regime. So ethnicity or the rise of ethno-nationalism remain a huge problem. It's getting poisonous, depending on some regions. Uh, so ethnic federalism has exacerbated uh, this issue. How do we get out of it? It's quite a challenge, you know. So there's, there's a massive amount of issues, agendas, on the table of the prime minister and leadership. It's an unbelievable level of issues. And fourthly, the question of youth unemployment. You know, 70, 110 million people in Ethiopia. 70% of that is under the age of 30 and unemployed. And how are you going to deal, you know, young people, you know, who are unemployed? How are you going to deliver the job part? It remains a challenge. So uh, this is going to be quite a challenge, it remains a challenge. The sixth factor is the geopolitical factor. You know, the geopolitical factor in the sense that we are uh, We live in Ethiopia, you know, basically located in a, in a terrible neighborhood. Okay. And the neighborhood is actually, you know, is expanding to the Gulf. So there's been a significant, so the overall, the Horn of Africa has become a battleground on which the Middle Eastern rivalries are playing out. So three main groups, basically V for influence, leave aside the Western powers, the Chinese and others. Uh, the, there's what he calls the Arab Axis, basically led by Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, including Egypt and Bahrain. And then you got the Iran Axis, significant influence of Iran in the region, and the Qatar-Turkey Axis. And we are incredibly involved by virtue of our need. <laughs> you know, the first thing you know, the UAE was to do was to give $3 billion to the Prime Minister Rabi, $2 billion in investment, $1 billion in budget support. Because the economy is in crisis. So we are increasingly getting a reduced in you know, petrol prices from Saudi Arabia. So the horn, the regional dimension, is also going to complicate, influence the nature and dynamics of political transitions at home. So what next? Where do we go next? Well, uh, the next two years leading to the 2020 elections are very critical. If I have my way, I would not have election for another two years, additional two years. Okay? But if that is the case, let's see if it's sorted out. I have different scenarios, what's going to happen during the next two years. I do believe with all my misgivings, with all this political drama, the newly transformed EPRDF, EPRDF dash OPDA ADP, as opposed to the old EPRDF TPLF, will be the primary force determining the directions of democratic transition in Ethiopia. They will remain because there's an incumbent party. And I do believe the opposition will have little impact on the transition process. It's, it's really kind of, for me, it's, it's really strange because, you know, what do they say, it's better to have the devil he knows than the devil he don't know or something like that. I have some misgiving about some of the opposition. They are fighting the past. They are not talking about the future. 
So, in fact, most, well, there are some differences. Most of the opposition leaders, you know, of my age, you know, I'm approaching 70 in April, my generation should be dead, actually. We should not have a role in the politics of the country. We've been part of the problem. Let other new fresh actors play that. We have been part of the problem. I'm not quite sure we can be part of the solution. Our time has, we are expired commodity, okay? <laughs> Let's give new guys to do it. So, but most of the opposition come from that generation. They think they have a claim on this. So my hope is some of them will emerge as reasonable forces, others will actually will die, others will split in different paths in two years, the only one that's not going to split it with APRDF, the new APRDF, while the others are going to play out. Uh, and the democracy that Ethiopia will embrace by 2020, if we do have election, will be completely different from the liberal democracy of the West, which most of us are familiar with. The Ethiopian version of democracy will be basically an outcome of those three ideas I talked about, the, the pillar, is a synthesis of that, depending how that goes on. It will have you know, laws and principles influenced by the development of the state, uh, ideology, remnant of socialist past, key element drawn from the liberal tradition, normative instruments, aspect, focus on human, human rights, election. It's a combination. It's going to be like a minestrone soup of some sort, but certainly is not going to look like a, a liberal democracy. So what next will be, we'll see the reform, EPRDF will be the only political party that will play a significant role. Opposition parties will have impact. After all, I don't know how many of them can, can qualify to be registered unless the citizenship laws are changed between now and then. So there is issues. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, reform and restructuring of defense forces prior to 2020 is going to be a critical one. It is in the agenda. Probably we'll see something presented to parliament very soon. Legal reform is going to be very challenging. The federal court system will have to be accelerated. There will be challenges because there is also, the regions can also appoint their own regional judges. So what is the contradiction? You may make progress at the federal level, but who's taking care of the judicial reform process at the regional state? There are nine, nine, nine regions. Uh, so that's a issue. So the legal reform should be quite, quite a challenging one. Uh, as I say, but there will be twists and turns in the process, but the transition uh, will proceed. Uh, there's no turning back. In that sense, I'm much more optimistic that because we're already on the floor you can't go any further you can only go up so the process will be what kind of democracy there will be in ethiopia remain to be seen uh, as i said is a result of an outcome of this different competing ideological uh, tendencies but overall what we're seeing now is at the macro level changes very exciting, but we also have to understand there are challenges. How those <coughs> challenges are going to be resolved? You know, what kind of you know, people does, does he need to lead key agencies? You know? uh, not only key agencies, the reform process has to go all the way down at the regional level. And that process is more likely to be uneven. It's been much more focused and fast in Oromia region, not so fast in the Amhara region. They are dealing with it, but very slow in the process. The same thing with the other regions. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's just multiple transitions taking place in Ethiopia at a multiplicity of places by a multiplicity of actors at the same time. So anything could happen. But overall, my own assessment, maybe, you know, with old age, you know, you become more reasonable, I guess. Uh, I think the trajectories are positive, 
but there will be also difficult times. For me, the most immediate one is the potential breakdown and a breakout of war between the Tigray region and the Amhara region. To what extent, here I go back to the Somalia region. What happened to the Somalia region when this brutal Somali president, using his own regional forces, massive level of human rights abuse. <coughs> People were crying out, you know, where is the federal government? But at some point, the brutality, the complaint has been so much, particularly the conflict between Somalia region that he perpetrated with Oromia, the massive displacement of people. There are 2.5 million people displaced in Ethiopia, internally displaced right now. This happened over the last two years. So that gave them the pretext the federal government to intervene, literally to intervene in Somalia region. Would they use the same tactics? Have a breakout of war between the two regions, gives them, the federal government, the right to intervene and then deal with those regional issues. Territories that are being appropriated by TPLF and others. So are they waiting for that moment to come so that there will be a federal intervention? You know, because right now they can't do that because of the federal the constitution forbids, because you're talking about regional autonomy. So are they waiting for something to happen so that they can intervene? in such a way they could be able to deal with that issue. So overall, as I said, I started out by mentioning the Arab Spring. And I will end, even though things tend to be very optimistic in Ethiopia, transitions are very difficult to predict. You know, so we were excited. We were all enthralled with what happened at Tahrir Square and others. So transitions are never guaranteed. So I think we need to understand the reform process, the challenge of state building, because the state has to be rebuilt. Because I have worked in practically in so many ministries, I know how the structure is set up. So how do you create that efficient, democratic, you know, responsive state institutions that meet the demand of the population remain a challenge. So let's be you know, let's keep the good vibes going on. In the meantime, let's also be aware there will be challenges. But overall, in terms of my score, I think with all the zigzags, the train will continue to travel to its eventual destination. I'll stop right here. Thank you very much, Fantu. It was very long and very complicated, mm -hmm. but it's really a difficult uh, issue to, to describe. And, and transitions are, as you said, very complicated. Now, we have a lot of people here who are very uh, knowledgeable about uh, Ethiopia. I think I'm going to start asking Cecilia to give a few points. She just came back from, from Ethiopia. Camilla. Hey, Camilla. Uh, working in the embassy. And you have met Fantu a number of times before, but a few comments from uh, the okay. Swedish embassy. Yes, thanks. From the point of view of, of uh, having worked in the Swedish <laughs> embassy. Um, you should keep this close to it, but it's not really a microphone for listening, it's for the, for the film. Uh, it's for the film. Okay, thank you very much. I should first clarify that uh, when I worked at the embassy, I actually, I arrived in Ethiopia two weeks before the former prime minister, or the pre-former, I'll just say that. Former, former. <laughs> former, former. <laughs> Mele Zinawi uh, passed away and I left Ethiopia a couple of months after Abiy had come to power and I lived through this very dramatic time that you described, Fanto. Thanks a lot. Um, but I didn't work on Ethiopia at all, so I cannot say anything about sort of Sweden's official position or analysis or actions during that time. Although I was in the embassy and of course all of us followed this as closely as we could. Um, and I tried, yeah, I worked, uh, I was heading the section for regional development cooperation at, um, 
at the embassy. So, but of course, this had strong regional implications also, and I think we have hopes now that, for instance, IGAD, the organization in the Horn of Africa, could possibly work, be more uh, efficient and, and work in a more cohesive way. I think many uh, an analysts make the, have hopes that if we can deepen multilateralism on the Horn, with the new leadership in Ethiopia that could help counterbalance or negotiate with the other powers that you refer to, not least the broader Middle East, so to speak. But I really, I mean, I think you already pointed to the questions I would have, and you already say that it's really difficult to read <laughs> uh, and to say anything, predict what could happen. Uh, of course, the elections 2020 uh, are extremely important, and how do we see the leadership preparing for a somewhat level playing field in 2020. I think the whole issue of the ethnic federation and what do we see in terms of starting to address that question and what could such a process mm -hmm. look like. And then of course security sector reform. We have seen the removal of the leadership, the top leadership, but what is happening below that and how loyal are federal forces and security apparatus to the current political leadership would be some of my questions. I have plenty of others, but I'm sure I see in the room also that there is probably a lot of, you know, um, additional knowledge that can add to this. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much. So now you can sit down, Fountain. We'll, what we do is we take a number of questions. And uh, how many can you take at the same time? Uh, that's up to you. You tell me when you want to start uh, replying. But I, so the floor is open. You can take up what comments or questions or. Okay, of course the one who is f furthest away. I can speak loudly. No, no, this is not for loud speaking. This is for for the we are filming. I have just a question about the uh, the ethnical uh, mix within the army, uh, we've seen a lot of conflicts around the world, uh, and we know that uh, when you ethnic conflicts um, based in the army, you know, we can see sometimes the result of that beforehand. So, can, can, Fiku, can you explain maybe about the, uh, the, the mix, the ethnic mix within the army? Thank you for an <coughs> extremely interesting presentation. Uh, I would like you to make some comments on the relationship with Eritrea and what you see uh, the effects on Eritrea of this change in Ethiopia. More? Okay. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Phantom. I can start from that. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentations, we have witnessed a tremendous change in the Horn of Africa after uh, Abiy Ahmed came to power. Uh, I'd like you to comment about um, the uh, uh, about the changes or the transitions. Would we able to see to see the changes after if something happens after this leadership? Could it be uh, continual or do you think it's going to be uh, some kind of sabotage if something happens? That's my first question. Uh, and the other thing is like in a couple of years I've been uh, uh, listening a lot of comments from IMF and World Bank about the economic development in Ethiopia, uh, irrespective of the violations of human rights uh, and of course the freedom of press. How do you relate to this kind of like analysis in this aspect? Thank you. I take this question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. First let me come back on the on question on the composition of the army. I don't have a lot of figures, but it's quite clear in terms of the rank and file of the army drawn from every corner of the country. But in terms of the high command, all the way down, the officer corps has been heavily, uh, heavily dominated by uh, TPLF or from the Tigray region. Although I must say, even under Prime Minister Haile Mariam period on, there has been quite a significant uh, promotion of into the higher echelons of the high command of from other groups, more accelerated now also after Abiy came to power. So that dynamics is changing right now. And of course, at this point, it's very difficult to tell in terms of the loyalty issues. 
and you know the loyalty because this incident that took place mm -hmm. in Addis when I was there when not more than 350 elite you know some of them are presidential guards you will call them marching in with their entire gear showing up to the prime minister's office demanding to see him and refusing to be disarmed by the deputy prime minister and then consequently they managed to disarm and then that dialogue actually I was of the opinion at that time this could not have happened just by 350 soldiers somebody higher up somewhere knows you know this just could not happen and I think the, the you know the later at least pronouncement by the prime minister two three weeks later after the incident where he said they came to kill me mm -hmm. is an indication there's a larger uh, what I call third fourth force or hidden power there so I still am skeptical about the on the question of the the legitimacy or the loyalty of the army and this may be taken into consideration in the current discussion that has been going on for the last month, particularly yesterday and today, with regard to the restructuring of the armed forces. <coughs> what form it will come out, that will be an indication. We have to see it. From there, we can deduce backwards and see X, Y, Z is happening. But it is a concern. Uh, I don't believe the current leadership is out of the woods in terms of threats. Two threats have been attempted, one in public, one marching in. And I, I can see already just uh, over the last two months the, the massive shift, you know, from palace guards to even, you know, security guards that accompany the prime minister have been completely altered. Uh, and there are issues in the military, but I could not put my fingers on it. So that's a very important question. We'll have to wait and see what the, the draft proclamation comes into uh, and see who is, who is shifted, who is to where, uh, remains remain to be seen. Because this was basically a private army of EPRDF. It was not the army of Ethiopia. It was the army of the party. You know, no question asked. So how to transform that? What is incentive structures? It's going to take some, some time. I'm quite sure they're getting a lot of assistance from the US, from Israel, and others. There's a lot of, you know, so something will come out. Probably a much smaller army, but highly professionalized army. So the size might be that not only the army, then you have to deal also the regional police force, controlled by the regional states. You know, do we disband them and create a federal police only that issues remain by itself there is a lot of history there and then you have militias you know in, in my work very just a month ago when i was in bardar i have to go somewhere else you know you have to deal with the militia i didn't know militias existed you know all these peasant guys you know with their armed staff have more power than the police forces <coughs> so what do you, how do you dismantle that remain going to be a challenge and how quickly that could be done because other forces can, with money, can, can use them. And I think that's already happening with all the various ethnic displacement you see has been instigated by third forces who are using financial resources. So that remains to be seen. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge and to create a really professional army and then to also see a really civilian control of the military. You know, how is that going to work out? What kind of leg legislative happens? So, that's going to be a remain, remain a critical, a critical issue. The second uh, question was uh, on Eritrea. That was a, a, a very important question. Uh, and it's promising. Uh, and we haven't seen any movement yet, you know, not even, a, a, you know, freeing political prisoners or another. There's a few that has been released, inconsequential people. 
But Isaiah simply cannot, cannot escape the forces. You know, this is a tsunami around him going on. And I think this situation has given him an amazing opportunity for faith saving and to come out as a real leader, you know. And you can see in his body language, you know, he's much more relaxed, he's much more... The question is, the threat is when people are throwing grenades at him. When are you going to free political prisoners? When are you going to have a press? That is going to create a problem for him. It has to be done on his own terms because he cannot escape what's going on across the border. You know. So it will I am actually much more optimistic. You know, he's God knows how old he might be right now, seventy to seventy three. He wants to leave office with grace. You know, he still has the respect of his people. You know, no matter what happens. He lives a very common common life. It's unbelievable as a president of a country. So I think he probably will, will do that on his own terms without appearing being put a gun on his head because that's one thing he cannot do. Uh, and to the extent, you know, they become very close with Prime Minister Abiy. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I think something will happen. You know, but he also have cannot delay any further. Give us some things that, you know, the sanctions are off now, it's lifted for him, there's no reason to complain about sanctions, that is lifted. So I think there's a possibility that he would actually move on in that direction. Uh, uh, I'm very optimistic because he has nothing to lose right now, except a lot to gain. You know, and age is of course another factor. So he can live with grace and remain very important person in the life of Eritrea, as a founding father, as a liberator. So I am in that sense, and as much as people complain that it's been too slow, I think we need to understand what are the internal dynamics going on, and what are the different things that are amazing. I think he's more likely. He probably also may want to feel confident that the Ethiopian transition is on sound footing. If the Ethiopian transition is sound footing, then he would be even more emboldened to do so. So in one way, he's lending hand indirectly to the transition in Ethiopia in different ways, you know. So I think it's, it's overall, I'm very, very confident something will happen there. You know, uh, but of course, you know, it's a, such a secretive society where you have to understand the dynamics, the forces that are at play to say th these are the kind of things that are preventing him to do so. But right now, everything is really in his favor. And he can walk out as the greatest, you know, statesman, as the father of the nation, and continue to have a major role, have a transitional arrangement give power to somebody else, create that, and still remain vital to Eritrean political life in general. Third question, uh, remind me again, sorry. You wrote about the change. Do we, can we change the transition, keep going, uh, if something happens to the leadership? Well, definitely, if, if that happens, so, well, it depends, we have to look into what are the balance of social forces that are there. Even if I be was to go, he's always talked about, you know, you know, Ethiopia will move on even after my death. He knows there is a major threat to the leadership right now. And that would be basically, you know, uh, I think this more than the election really, this next two years is to expand the leadership, the leadership space. You know, even if we were to go, even for Lemma was to go, there's always going to be more people to step in and, into that vacuum. Uh, I mean, I have to be optimistic that it will go on. You know, 
I, I have to because there is there's no way of going back. I mean, there's so much death, so much suffering, so much repression in that country. We can only go on in the future. So I think we will, you know, there will be problems. There will be people trying to stop by virtue of their narrow interest. But generally, I think the transition will go on. The question is how they use this next two years to consolidate, to strengthen the legal system, the armed forces reform, all these vital areas was very critical. On the economy, well, the economy is definitely in as much as a celebrated, you know, high growth, etc. it has a lot of problems. It has a lot of problem, uh, and certainly the the fundamentals of the developmental state will be there. The rough edges will be smoothed. There is certainly a role to open up significant space to private sector development. But private sector development is also in contradiction with the ideology of developmental state. That's what I mean. These contradictions. What aspect of the developmental state should be retained? What aspect should be gone? On the question of, you know, there is that level. There's also a high level of debt in the country. You know, a lot of borrowing that have been done, particularly from China. Uh, a huge problem, you know. you know. My own theory is, I think it's a gamble. I'm, I admire them embarking on a strategy of industrialization but I think the basis for that should be going back to the roots, going back how to revitalize, you know, agriculture. 85% of the population are still pheasant farmers. So there the, the needs to be a link between the two. Right now, there's a huge gamble on the industrialization agenda at a time where there are many other competing countries with Ethiopia competing with Vietnam, Bangladesh, Philippines, and others. So there is a sort of, you know, one-sided view on this to look into the whole space and how do you vitalize private sector development, how do you vitalize the agricultural sector, basically. And if I can just tell you, for example, with regard to textile development or the leather sector, which the, the government is, you know, we can't even provide you know, fine, usable cotton. Cotton is imported from other countries. Leather is imported from other countries. So there needs to be an urban-rural linkage. The need to link that have to be happened. I think there are a little bit of opening uh, right now, but huge foreign exchange shortages right now. Huge level of debt. And our debt service payment is every year is close to about $400 million. You know, so, so these are the kind of challenges we see. Let's allow for two more questions. Okay. I saw Doug. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for your excellent presentation. Really interesting. Um, my name is Doug Aaron Price. I would like to ask you about going back to the context in which all this change has been happening that you talked so much about. Um, Every year when the, U when the UNDP's Human Development Report is published, I, I go back to the table section and look at table number two, where, where there are numbers for uh, the rate of change in the Human Development Index of all countries, or almost all countries. And two countries stand out over the last, say, 25 years, or in the Ethiopian case, o over the Mellis period, I think you could say. Amen. And those are Ethiopia and Rwanda, way above all other countries in terms of uh, social and economic uh, development. Uh, so, w you know, whenever I mention this, some people who are critical of what's going on for good reasons, uh, of lack of human rights and democracy in Ethiopia will say that, well, these figures are manipulated and you can't really trust them. So my first question is, what is your assessment of that? Secondly, if there is some considerable uh, level of truth in these numbers, or the fact that there have been very positive and progressive social and economic change in Ethiopia over the last 25 years, 
How does that, why did Ethiopia then end up in this political chaos that we've seen in the last uh, five, six years? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see no other hand, so I add one more question. Oh. Okay. <laughs> No, only one more. Yeah, go ahead and this first. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fantu, for uh, helping us to understand somehow. I know in the process you are also trying to understand it. Uh, my question is, I would like to share your optimism, but so far the Prime Minister didn't give us any roadmap. He's yeah. just keeping us surprised every other day, maybe every other hour. I'm enjoying that surprise, personally. Uh, but how long can we go with this kind of mm. surprise? Where are we heading, let's say, after two years, three years? So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling uh, to, to share that optimism. So, w what's your comment on that? Thanks. Let me start with Doug's question first on those numbers. At least the Miller's period. You know, this is, you know, I work very closely with the National Planning Commission. I deal with this issue. Those numbers are actually, I mean, they may be plus and minus in terms of the positive aspect. This is true. The social indicators. From where you start, where, from where Ethiopia is, is unbelievable development. But on the other hand, <laughs> that's my problem because on the other hand, if you look, for example, just take education, for example, you know, and, you know what, what the expansion has been, the number of people, but the quality issues is just atrocious, really atrocious. So it was a numbers game. Nobody was talking about quality. Nobody was talking about sustainability of that project. In terms of you looking at the reduction of poverty, were significant changes that took place. In terms of access to health care, etc., if I'm the clinic, every Kabale have their own, I mean, they may not have everything you want, but there's something there. The outreach has been brilliant, but in terms of quality, sustainability, is unbelievable. I mean, I have been teaching now for two years now at the universities there. We used to have three universities. We have 53 universities right now. The entire PhD program at Bardar University is manned by me and another colleague in Holland. You can't. I mean, you have to have a PhD, somebody with a PhD, a professor with a PhD, before you can have a PhD program. So there's a lot of numbers game, numbers games that are played. Overall, on the social area, there has been, if you look into access to microfinance, for example, you know, access to health, many other things, they are there. But can they be sustained? Do they add value at the end of the day in the quality of life, a person, sustainability? So there was a lot of number stuff that we're beginning to grapple right now, you know. So there was, it was driven most often politically, you know, it's a political project. If you just, I mean, take for example, the Addis Ababa, light rail system. You know, the already and I've been involved with this group. The whole idea was the rapid bus transit system, similar to what we've seen in Brazilian city. But Mendes wants a train. He wants a bloody train for the Africa Union 50th anniversary. They completely destroyed the city. It is highly expensive, you know. It was also numbers. It was about the Mellis legacy. Rather than what does it mean? Can we pay for ourselves? Can it be sustained? All these issues to the political project of social transformation, rather than really in the real sense of economic development. But certainly there has been, the numbers are right, you know, but we have to ask what do they mean? You know. And that question has never been asked. I think we may have to retry, redo a lot of things again, actually, to really give. I mean, I don't know how many, 40,000 people graduate from the universities every year. And nobody can read a paragraph in English. 
but I have a master's in something else. So something else suffered, so we may have to reinvest again. So it was, yes, there's some element of truth, but you have to go behind the number to, to see that. Uh, a follow-up question you have uh, was... Well, with all this progress, how come you get split? Exactly, exactly, because it was basically, it didn't, you can see it, I mean, it's amazing, particularly from 2010 on, even before the death of Mullahs, you can literally see the rate of inequality growing. The party became basically a patronage system. You know, people who have not even have an elementary school certificate <coughs> have a 20-story building. I mean, how do you, how, you know, what am I saying? You look around, you know, I must be a stupid professor, I'm in the wrong business. What's going on? So you begin to see the accumulation. The party became an important element of accumulation. And very few people got rich. So people begin to see that. So that became, they saw that development has not really reached them. That became the sources, the economy became the monopoly of certain businesses, particularly party-owned enterprises, mega projects, etc. They became a way of rewarding political parties. That became glaringly become much more you know, obvious to people. So in a sense, you're right. I mean, there was those contradiction. So now, the danger now I see in Ethiopia is we know that what happened. The opposite opinion right now is everything that has happened in the past is so bad, we need to privatize everything in Ethiopia. So the question is, there is a counter stuff putting pressure, business communities and others, on the leadership to happily privatize everything. Even, even Ethiopian Airlines, which is supposed to be a better airlines, and many other stuff is beginning to happen. So this contradiction on privatization is again itself an, a particular issue in which a major political conflict is going to, to be uh, a fought around over that. So that, that, that issue has become an important element of the struggle. So when you look at overall, yes, certain things have changed, but as you know, does it have, you know, what it could grow with depth. There was no depth to it, you know. It was not broad enough in many ways. The initial five years, seven years, there have been some tremendous stuff. All of a sudden, things have gone up. So all this issue, how do you rewrite history, is going to be an important element on the economy, on the politics, on social relations, on ethnicity. The list goes on and on in terms of the political challenge for the regime. And finally, uh, to Ms. Vince, uh, remind me again, my, the, roadmap. The, ro the roadmap, yeah. The roadmap, th there was no roadmap because it was an accidental prime ministership. <laughs> They didn't have a plan B. They was not even sure what was going to happen. All of a sudden they did. Okay? So there is no roadmap. That's a frustration. There is no signal to the private sector. There is no signal to farmers. There is no signal to students. There isn't. We have already abandoned even the old roadmap, which is GTP2. Halfway through implementation is abandoned. <laughs> So right, everything is, is, is nothing there right now. So the roadmap on the political transition, on the economic transition, on constitutional reform, on all this stuff is more incremental. So you don't see the picture. And I'm trying to get a full picture so that it's like playing, you know, the, putting the puzzle together and a puzzle board. And they are, they are meeting, they are coming. They're coming every day for which you get excited about it. But how does it fit in the broader puzzle remains a challenge. I think, I mean, I would have loved to have seen a transitional budget, a transitional budget which will have some concrete pillars. And we can, I will take that as a plan because that's an indication of the priorities, etc. So right now, when will that come out remains to be seen. Uh, and part of it is also the skills issue. You don't have enough people. You can't go back to the very people who screwed up the country to write a roadmap. In the meantime, you don't have people that, that you can draw in 
to do so. They have been able to you know, poach you know, people from different international organizations, put them in the prime minister's office. Those are the people who are working. But you need to go deeper than that. You need to have a different ways of constituting that elements of how to deal with, 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 with this issue. And I mean, relative to my experience working for the transitional government in 1991 with, with, with Meles's office, there was a plan. There was a number of plans. I remember coming to Norway to the Christian Mikkelsen Institute <coughs> for three weeks writing a plan on one aspect of the plan. So a different contribution. They have their own, of course, from the bush, but they also have to deal with the realities, <coughs> you know, they, they, they took over power at a time where communism died. So they can't go with communist ideology, so they have to change their tune. So they need a plan to present to different areas. So there was an element of a plan, you know, a transitional development plan, a transitional budget, even though they hated the stuff, because they can't swallow it. It was inconsistent with their own ideology. But there was something to deal with. Right now, I haven't seen one. I would love to see one, you know, in such a way that gives us some indication. The best would have been the budget, a transitional budget for the next two years that would prioritize certain things, etc. That would also signal to the regional government how they can prioritize their own development plan at the regional level, you know, tax reform. So everything is incremental, eh? and I don't even know who the different teams right now at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Fantu. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Let, let me just say one word as en uh, to end this. I mean, you have done a very good explanation of the complicity of transition. And the, thing, the thought that uh, strikes, what strikes you is, it's so easy to destroy. It's so easy to, to, um, to, uh, start a process which is a, is a, where a country is going downwards, and and it's so complicated to build up again, and uh, particularly after after a long period of of, of uh, authoritarian oppressive rule, it becomes a, and I can very well understand that it's not so easy to make a plan the, the first day after you have gone through uh, a, a long period of oppression and, and to, to say how exactly you should go. And it's quite fantastic. It seems anyway that from what is being done every day that there is a direction in, 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 in what they are doing. But thank you very much, thank Fantu. You. I think we all have got a lot of food for thought. And Let's keep a little ray of hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>